When one thinks of the Catholic Church, there are many images that come to mind, but the most obvious is the Church itself. St. Peter's Basilica, located in Vatican City, is one of the holiest Catholic sites in the world, and it is also the burial site of St. Peter. As a major Catholic site, we can look at the Vatican as a place that honors Jesus' teachings, but let's take a look inside of the Church to see if that's true. Inside of St. Peter's Basilica, people can view the wealth of historical art and the tombs of popes such as Pope Pius XI and Pope John Paul II. It is obvious that the church is worth a lot of money because of its art and treasures, but we don't know its exact value because most things in the church are priceless. Furthermore, the Vatican lists artwork and relics as one euro simply because they are priceless. People, however, have estimated the value of St. Peter's Basilica to be around $2.42 billion. About $22.4 million of those dollars are the approximate value of what's one ton of gold owned by the Vatican. But treasures and relics aren't the only thing that the church gets money from. Tourism alone made the Vatican about $113 million in 2011. So how did the church get to be so wealthy before tourism? Well, there are many responses to this question, but a couple are selling indulgences and relics, making people pay taxes, and paying for whatever actions the church had a role in, such as marriages and baptisms. One way that the church got rich was because of indulgences, which are forgivenesses for sins which weren't meant to release one from eternal punishment. Indulgences became popular during the Middle Ages and were generally rewarded after one did a good deed, but were only supposed to be used after going to confession. The church soon gave permission to sell these indulgences to fund expensive projects such as the Crusades and the building of cathedrals. Pope Leo X also offered indulgences for the people who gave alms to rebuild St. Peter's Basilica. The church received a lot of money from the sale of indulgences, especially because the people who sold those indulgences would lie to purchasers and say that the indulgence would save them from eternal damnation. This chaos resulted in Martin Luther writing his 95 Theses where he stated that indulgences were just the purchase and sale of salvation, and he rejected the Pope's right to grant pardons on God's behalf. In addition to selling indulgences, the church also sold relics. Relics were different objects such as straw, hay, and pieces of the cross that Jesus was crucified on that were sold to people in order to become closer to saints and please God. Selling relics were also sanctioned by the Vatican. On top of selling indulgences and relics, peasants had to pay money and taxes or rent to the church. In addition to their rent for land, they had to pay a tax to the church called a tithe. A tithe was 10% of the value of the farmer's produce that year, and it could be paid through money or food. Because of the abundance of money and seeds that the church received, tithe farms were constructed, with one of the biggest being in Maidstone, Kent. The church also received money through regular ceremonies such as marriage and baptism and also being buried on holy ground. These less than honorable ways of getting money don't really seem that they would resonate with Jesus' teachings on wealth. So what exactly did Jesus say concerning wealth? There are many different instances throughout the Gospels where Jesus talks about the importance of being humble and giving away material possessions. In the parable of the rich fool, Jesus observes that a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things he possesseth. In Matthew 19.21, Jesus says that if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will treasure in heaven. Now these two sayings don't really go along with the $8 billion Vatican, and neither does the story of Jesus and the money changers. Once he enters the temple, he told the money changers that my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Not only does Jesus condemn the money changers' actions in the temple, but in Matthew 6:19 he says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. Matthew 10 provides another view that Jesus has on wealth. A man ran up to Jesus and asked him, What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus told him that he should follow the commandments. But the man replied that he had done all those things since he was little. Jesus then said that the only thing he lacked was to sell everything he had and give it to the poor, and only then would he have treasure in heaven. The man was obviously not very happy about this outcome, and he left very sad. And then Jesus told his disciples how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. It is obvious that selling indulgences and relics aren't an honorable way of raising money for a church whose important figure is said to not store up treasures on earth. But that isn't the only thing that the church has done that doesn't really resonate with Jesus' teachings. 
The fourth crusades brought in a lot of gold, money, and jewels because of the pillaging of villages. But the most interesting current issue with the church is the Institute for Religious Works, or IOR. The IOR is the bank whose mission it is to serve the Catholic Church by safeguarding the assets of institutions and individuals related to the Holy See and the Catholic Church and providing them with payment services. IOR was founded by Pope Pius XII in June 27, 1942. It is currently managed by a board of superintendents along with a commission of cardinals who all report directly to the Vatican. But the IOR has been in a bit of trouble recently because it's being investigated for money laundering. The bank fired chairman Ettore Gotti Tedeschi after the scandal and the Italian prosecutor seized 23 million euros from the IOR. This isn't the only time that the IOR has been investigated for money laundering though. There was fraudulent bankruptcy of Banco Ambrosiano in 1982 where the Vatican had to pay $240 million to compensate Ambrosio's account holders. These issues with the IOR stem from the lack of clarity about what the IOR deals with and what the IOR actually is. The Church has repeatedly said that the IOR is not actually a bank, but rather a unique financial institution aimed at managing assets for religious or charitable works. IOR does, however, hold money and have interest rates, and in 2012, they made 25.8 million euros in loans, not to mention the 41.3 million euros in gold, metals, and precious coins. IOR currently has 18,900 customers, who are all a part of the Catholic Church, and their net profit in 2012 was 86.6 million euros. The Church's total assets in 2012 were around 5 million euros, but the main reason as to why they are being investigated is because of the cash deposits and withdrawals by missions in Iran, Iraq, and Indonesia. These various withdrawals and deposits were each around 500,000 euros and were taken out and put back into the bank various times during the course of a month. The action of withdrawing the money itself is not illegal, but IOR hasn't provided enough details to testify to the legitimacy of these transactions. In the aftermath of this scandal, IOR has engaged itself in a process of comprehensive reform to foster the most rigorous professional and compliance standard. After seeing the sale of indulgences and relics and the money laundering scandal that the church has been through, the kingdom of God seems to be a bit more involved with money than Jesus said it should be. But does the church have a reason to have an abundance of money even though the gospels don't back them up on their assets? It is obvious that with money comes power. And it is because of this that the church needs to have money to spread the message of Jesus. But is it too much? The money that the church has and spends is debatably necessary, but the Mercedes-Benz Pope Mobile is a little much. Because of the church's power, it has established itself as the place to worship God. But there seems to be too much power in the church's hands, and that detracts from the message of God and worship that they are trying to get across to people. Or at least should be. Of course, religions use gold and other precious metals to honor their god or gods because it's the closest thing we have to something divine. The church obviously doesn't possess all this wealth without giving a substantial amount of it back, but once you look at the numbers, there's still a lot of profit. An $8 billion institution with 86.6 million euros net profit, all for a priceless god and his humble son. Doesn't really match up, does it?